Good morning, everybody. And, uh, better make a start. So we have reached the very last session of this retreat. Probably quite different people from when we came in. And even though I know it's been a wonderful journey for many of you, and an interesting one, and hopefully one of great learning also, all good things come to an end. So the retreat ends, but your practice, your path, doesn't end. It continues. And this is a very incredibly precious gift that we've received, to find the Buddha's teachings and to have faith in those teachings. This is something that perhaps we've been looking for for lifetimes. And we get a sense that this really is the way. This really is leading to a sense of real, genuine peace and deep freedom that we can rely on. And however much of that you've tasted, it only gets better. It only gets more peaceful, more free, more uh, conducive to the arising of wisdom. The kind of wisdom that will transform your daily lives as well. Not only the way you feel in your meditation retreat, but the way you behave and act and regard other people, yourself, the world the duties that you have to do in the world. So this morning, we don't have a lot of time, so I was just going to recap on what we've learned on this retreat and talk about how you can continue to nurture the little plant that has uh, just come out of the seed. You planted seeds in a fertile soil. That fertile soil is your own goodness, the virtue that you've been developing in your life. And all of you here are incredibly virtuous and generous people, inclined towards the good. It doesn't matter if you've made mistakes, everybody does, that's part of being a human being. But you're inclining in the right direction and you're learning to take responsibility for your own actions. This is one of the things that uh, is a special quality of those on the path. We're starting to turn inside instead of blaming the world for the difficulties we face. And so you have um, had a toolkit here and different ways to keep those, uh, to nurture those seeds and to bring that little shoot to life so that it can grow into a beautiful flower, maybe even a huge big tree that can provide shade for you and for all beings. So we started this retreat by learning the right approaches to meditation, learning how to relax the body, relax the mind, and approach practice with a sense of contentment, with a sense of good enough that enables us to really meet the moment and to learn from the moment rather than try to teach the moment how it should be. We actually learn to open up to it so it can teach us its secrets. So we learn to make peace, let go, stop controlling our minds and our bodies and to have this beautiful attitude, relationship of loving-kindness with whatever we experience. And regard it also, or hold those experiences with a gentle mind, not with a vice-like grip of a mind, but with a very gentle, soft mind that gives things confidence, you know, you, you stay with your breath with a sense of confidence, you know, you value it, you rest on it, you embrace it, but not squeezing it, grasping it tight. And the same with this whole process, we can't force that little plant to grow. We have to just keep tending it, and we can tend it any time with this peace, this compassion and kindness, and also a sense of gentle patience that allows things time to grow. We then talked about this whole realm of happiness and suffering, and tried to define what happiness really is, and also suffering, and the role that can play in developing a wise mind, and learning about the way our minds work when we regard it properly again, you know, rather than rejecting the suffering in our lives or trying to push it away or maybe over-identifying and rolling in it. Instead, we take it as um, a universal reality, try to understand this is not personal to ourselves and again, relate with kindness, recognizing that this is a place that we can learn, this is a place that we can deepen our compassion and concern for all of humanity, because all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. This is one of the Buddha's uh, phrases in the suttas that is a great motivational um, idea that leads to 
responding to that suffering from a place of goodwill. And then we talked about mindfulness and how to develop this uh, present moment awareness with whatever it is that we're doing. And not only that, but to also notice what we're putting between what we have to do and our mind. So what is our relationship again? And we can notice this from the perspective of the six senses. Yeah, we can notice how we respond to the sights, sounds, smells, tastes and touches, and also the impact that they have on our mind. And we can try to use our senses in a way that, again, cultivates wholesome states and leads to uh, the reduction of unwholesome states, which really means anything that is harmful for you or others. Yeah? And instead we try to generate ways of looking, ways of regarding this world, that lead to happiness arising, to gratitude and a sense of, um, again, goodwill, patience, trust. Yeah, because all beings are just products of their conditioning. They're trying their best, just as we are. So sometimes we have to give people the benefit of the doubt. And we talked also about the importance of joy in meditation and how to arouse that joy. And uh, we spoke about various practices, like reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha, uh, reflecting on the Dhamma, which may mean what you've read in the suttas and whether that resonates for you but also your own experience in meditation, bringing that up, bringing up as a visceral felt sense, peace, contentment, you know, putting yourself in those experiences again when you felt most peaceful in your life and letting the mind incline in that direction. Of course, that included the practice of loving kindness as well, which is a beautiful, powerful way to develop happy states of mind that are based on ethics, a virtuous foundation that really... Um, takes its interest in the good of other beings and ourselves. So it's inclusive, embracing, impartial, and in eventually measureless, and a great resource for the mind, especially when we come to the deeper stages of um, wisdom. We find we have this inner resource that cushions us against anything that could otherwise shake a less prepared mind. And, of course, lastly, we spoke about wisdom and uh, looked at how the practice of Anapanasati is essentially the same as the practice of the four Satipatthanas. It completes that practice. Yeah, when we're watching the breath coming in and out, this is body contemplation. When we start to feel the feelings associated with the breath, the pleasure, the piti, the sukha, this is like Vedana, this is like the contemplation of feelings, the second Satipatthana. And then when we start to see maybe the mental aspect of the breath, maybe it appears as a light or something very soft, and you see this, um, this brightness of the mind, this is the same as the Chittanupassana, the third Satipatthana that looks at the mind. And then lastly, the development of wisdom as a result of those deep states of meditation, looking at impermanence and letting go, and noticing how every phenomena fades because it's conditioned by causes. This is equivalent to fulfilling the last Satipatthana. So that, that is the contemplation of mental phenomena. So really there's no difference between insight practice and calm. And if calm is really worth anything, it should be deepening insight. It should be a product of the wisdom you have into suffering and its cause. And likewise, the wisdom, if you're really wise, if you really uh, understand the way this mind works, then you will know how to still the mind. You'll know what causes craving, what causes agitation, and you'll know what causes peace. So the two deepen each other, and as one deepens, the other also deepens. So the deeper the calm, the deeper the wisdom, the deeper the wisdom, the more easily you'll access these deep states of mind. So I want to get on to um, how we can sustain our practice in daily life. And first of all, you might not like me saying this, but um, we have to be realistic. Because I know for many of you, you know, perhaps you'd quite like the retreat to continue. I might be included in, <laughs> in that quorum of people here. It would be lovely not to go back to my duties just yet. <laughs> my duties in the world of running a monastery and taking care of so many people and dealing with so many emails. But the reality is, you know, we have to learn to integrate the practice we do on retreat with our daily lives. 
and learn again to approach things in more skillful ways. And don't think that this is just an in-between thing that you have to do. This is an incredibly fertile ground where you can cultivate the causes for deep meditation. You can cultivate the other factors of the path. So realistically, you're probably not going to have the same amount of time to develop stillness. But that doesn't mean these states won't arise and that you can't deepen it to some degree. Things happen when you least expect it. Just like that little plant blooms at the most unexpected times. Suddenly there might be a shower or there might be a beautiful sunrise and that little plant will suddenly open its uh, petals and uh, be very beautiful. And even this morning somebody spoke to me about a spontaneous opening of the heart full of loving kindness that appeared from nowhere. But of course we know that this is the result of planting those seeds and watering them properly, giving them the proper sunshine. And they bloom according to their nature, not according to when you think they should bloom. So we have these little plants and they're very delicate. We need to guard them, we need to fertilise them. And it's true that sometimes we might be able to see, oh, this is a beautiful plant. Um, this plant is, is a little bit um, gnarled or maybe it's only just coming out, you know. And we can think that we can measure people that way. But actually, we're all just at different stages of growth. There's no valuation between one kind of plant and another, between one flower and another. They're all beautiful in their own ways. And I think what we also see as teachers is not only the quality of the plant, but the quality of the soil that it's planted in. And if that soil is moist and fertile with sila, <laughs> with virtue, then that plant will continue to grow, even if it's only very small, very unpromising. Maybe you can just see the smallest bit of green. If that soil is fertile, we can predict that plant is going to be beautiful and it will maybe overtake those large plants in very hard and rocky soil. <laughs> so keep your soil moist by the practice of virtue. And sila practice, virtue, is actually very beautiful, very fun, and you can really mine it for all it's worth. The Buddha said it leads to anavajasukha, which means blameless bliss. It's the bliss of non-remorse. When you can go to bed in the evening and say, I've done what is good, I've abstained from what's harmful. I've made myself a beautiful abiding. Yeah? And you can really feel happy for your life. And in the suttas it says that if we reflect this way, one who's done good reflects like this. It's as though their goodness envelops them and overspreads them. And uh, just like the shadow of a, mount, of a mountain when the sun goes down, we get completely um, enveloped by that shade. So in the same way, we get suffused with the goodness of our lives. And we can practice uh, feeling that, bringing that up, noticing that, and, and really rejoicing. You don't have to focus on the faults. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, the do's rather than the don'ts of the practice of virtue, the positive aspects. So we all know about um, abstaining from killing life, but on the positive side, we start to learn to nurture life, to protect life. Even the smallest little life forms, like little ants or mosquitoes, you know, as Ajahnito said at some point in this retreat, they're only looking for food. If you see the little birds around you, you know, Sometimes we think they're so cute, but actually they're terrified. They're looking around them all the time for the threat of the predator, you know. And when we see this in the animal world, we can have so much compassion that these beings are not there to harm us in any way, and we need to protect them. You know, our virtue should be a refuge, a source of safety for them, for all beings. So we take care to nurture life, which can also mean encouraging people to live a good life, yeah. Instead of stealing, we're generous. We're generous not only financially with our resources, maybe money resources, maybe things that we have that we can share. You know, we can um, support charities that we believe in. We can try to um, share the Dhamma that's benefited us so much. And in our daily interactions with the pe people <coughs> close, we can share our time. You know, we can give them the gift of time, of a listening ear that's kind and non-judgmental rather than someone who wants to fix another person and measure them and tell them what's wrong, we can actually just listen and be generous in that way. Sometimes a person's problems are fixed just by being heard. So there's all kinds of ways we can give of ourselves, give of our lives. 
for the benefit of all. And I think this puts a completely different perspective on what we're here to do. You know, we start to serve our values rather than our feelings. Yeah. We're not just looking for instant gratification, for things that give us a, a kind of instant joy, but we're looking at the long-term aims of our lives. And sometimes that might require a little bit of restraint, but the benefits over time pay off. We're serving our values, living a values-aligned life, and we can bring our whole practice in line with the Eightfold Path in this way. So the next uh, precept is the one to abstain from sexual misconduct, which should be very clear. But if we look at the other side of that, what about, I mean, for us, we're celibate, monastics, so we don't have any. So does that mean that precept's perfect and pure? I think it can be improved. We can also learn to be committed people, committed to what we do, committed to our promises, people whose word you can trust, you know, who are congruent in their speech, in their action, um, not just in how they show up, but how they actually live. And we can be loyal to the people around us. You know, one of the beautiful things about travelling with Ajahn Brown is that um, he's always on time. I love that. I really value that so much. It's like if you say you're going to be somewhere, try to be there. Try not to think, well, I've got a mobile, I can keep adjusting the time, you know, like I'm on my way, okay, five more minutes, okay, ten more. Okay, well, it's the traffic's fault, you know. <laughs> Allow for the traffic before you leave your destination. <laughs> and try to be someone who keeps their word, keeps their promises. Yeah. It's also an aspect of right speech. This is uh, the next one, which is the right speech. And I think this is very beautiful because it's not only not to lie, it's to abstain from false speech, that's the lying, harsh speech, um, useless speech or gossip, and what's the other one for? Malicious speech. So the beautiful side of that is that we learn to use speech in ways that really uplift other people. Imagine if every sentence you spoke was a gift. You know, if every time you open your mouth, you try to say something that would help another person, that would soothe their fear, that would give them encouragement. It doesn't have to be praise, and it certainly shouldn't be insincere. But the Buddha speaks about words that go to the heart, that bring together those who are divided, that uh, rejoice in harmony, that are worth recording. In essence, that people can trust, yeah? And we try to be really true to our experience. We try to speak from our own experience rather than kind of adding a lot of interpretations on there. And I think this is an important point when it comes to speaking about other people. So often we say, such and such did this, they must have meant this or that. But actually we can never know where another person's coming from, what their motivations really are. You know, how can we ascribe intentions to another? We can only know if we're lucky, at best, where our own intentions are coming from. And intentions are often mixed. You know, it's, it's very hard to have a 100% pure intention all of the time, but we try to lean towards that purity of intention and, again, give others the benefit of the doubt. And then the last abstinence, if you like, is to abstain from uh, um, alcohol and drugs, essentially things that distort the clarity of the mind. So sometimes people say, does that include coffee or cigarettes? And that's not really the case in these precepts. But still, if you see that that's causing agitation, and of course something like cigarettes is very addictive, and you become a slave to that substance, then it's probably not going to benefit you in the long term on the path. Instead, it might be good to look at what's underneath that, what's driving that and find another source of nourishment and fulfilment for the mind. Often we turn to these things when there's a sense of lack or a sense of um, emptiness, but not a positive one, a kind of hollowness inside. And it's an unpleasant state to be with, but if we can learn to be with these states with a sense of kindness and patience and forgiveness for ourselves, and try and seek wholesome input instead, you know, even if it's just putting on a talk or a guided meditation, we can gradually come away from this sort of addictions of the mind. And instead value that clarity, that sobriety, uh, that sense of brightness that uh, many of you have experienced in the mind, whether as lights or just this uh, arising of mindfulness, feeling like, you know, things are becoming so much clearer. You're seeing where the problem lies. So these are some of the ways we can practice sila, and really underlying all of it is to live a harmless life. 
It's to move from, you know, actions of body, speech and mind that are harmful to those that are far less harmful. And it's founded on those right intentions. If we have intentions of loving kindness, of compassion, of letting go, giving rather than acquiring, then naturally the speech and the action that follows will be pure, will be wholesome. And there's a lot more to it, of course, to see that our behaviour is skillful according to the context, but this is something we learn on the way. We learn as we practice. And that sila deepens even to the level of the mind when we practice sense restraint. We start to see the way we're um, picking up our experiences of life. You know, Are we reacting with aversion? Are we allowing all kinds of unwholesome inputs into our mind? You'll probably notice when you leave here, although if you stay in Norway, perhaps not too much, you might notice a lot more sensory input. I don't know, maybe in Oslo, yeah. The billboards, the adverts, the traffic, you know, the highways. People's faces might look grumpy more than you remember because, believe it or not, you've acquired a lot of happiness here that's rare to find. And when we go back into the world sometimes, it's quite shocking to see how people are running around really looking quite distressed, maybe quite lost, at least fairly numb quite often. And, you know, to have compassion for that, and to try to stay centered in what you've learned and not to allow too much of a negative input. But at the same time, remember that you do have an inner strength that can now become inspiring for others. So it might enable us to actually have a positive effect on others. But we also have to guard that little plant and see that we don't become a kind of doormat for other people's um, uh, misery, if you like. Yeah? So we have to know our boundaries there. We have to know when there's no escape <laughs> from the input of the senses and find ways to regard them that cultivate, that look, focus on some things that lead to wholesome states. So you don't have to focus on another person's faults. You can focus on their qualities. You know, maybe you have a colleague who's really difficult, but they're actually in a really good livelihood. They obviously chose that because they wanted to do something positive in this world. Right? So we can really hold these in mind and can remind people of the reasons that they chose what they do and encourage them to you know, really be their best yeah? instead of looking for the faults. So we can see when we start to regard things in negative ways because we get grumbly and groggy and everybody else suffers because of us, right? So from time to time, take a step back as well and just allow yourself some quiet so that you can... Um, Reflect in a positive way on your life with gratitude. In the suttas, there's a lovely passage that talks about um, three monks who lived together. And it says that they were successful in their meditation because they regarded each other with kindly eyes, with eyes of loving kindness. And they frequently reflected, what a great gain it is for me to live with such virtuous companions in the spiritual life. What a great gain. So don't niggle about people's little kind of idiosyncratic so-called faults. You know, we're going to see them, especially if we live with people all the time, and they're going to see us. But these people are good people, essentially. So why don't we reflect about how grateful we really are, how fortunate, how blessed that we're not associating with the fools, we're associating mostly with the wise. And uh, gosh, there's a lot more I wanted to say, and I'm running out of time. But I did want to say that to guard that little plant, we have to sometimes remove the weeds. And one of the ways of removing weeds is removing resentments that can arise. And uh, there's a lovely passage in a sutta called The Simile of the Saw. It's Majima number 21. All the references will be in your post-retreat email. And this is realistic, but also very helpful and helps us rise above. Um, situations where others may not treat us well. So in that sutta it says that there are five ways people might address us with speech. Their speech may be timely or untimely. It may be gentle or harsh. It may be true or untrue, connected with good or connected with harm. And it may be said with a mind of loving kindness or with a mind of inner hate. This is just the reality. And the Buddha said, when people approach you in these ways, hopefully not all five at once, <laughs> we should think this way. Our minds will be, remain unaffected. 
we shall utter no evil words or bad words, harmful words. Uh, we shall ab abide compassionate for their welfare. And starting with that person, abide in loving kindness, suffusing them first and then suffusing all beings. So we don't let these things get us down. And sometimes there is... Um, room for starting with a person who's immediately harmed us. Just start straight away. Don't let it build. Don't let it go into the heart and keep on replaying, you know. Just start to um, uh, change your attitude there and then. And, you know, in a sense, take the higher ground. There's lots more I wanted to say about removing resentment, but basically it's having loving kindness, having compassion, a sense of understanding that that person is struggling in some way. That's why they harm other people. Nobody wants to harm another. But sometimes we just can't see clearly what we're doing, especially when we're going through difficulties ourselves. Sometimes we have to temporarily take distance from a person. Other times we have to develop this idea of equanimity, realizing that a person's karma is their own. They go according to their causes and conditions just as we do and not according to our wishes for them. We can have goodwill, we can have compassion, but that isn't going to change another, and that's not the purpose. The purpose is to change our own heart. So, in our daily practice, <laughs> it's important to keep this mindfulness as a guard to the mind. Keep aware of what you're doing, why you're doing it, the context, the appropriateness of whatever you're doing. So mindfulness has this other aspect of a gatekeeper, understanding the purpose of what it is you do. And it's only with mindfulness that we can see the problem when it arises. So if we lose our mindfulness, things become cloudy again, right? So if you can, take some time for meditation every day. And if that's not possible, please don't worry. Remember your soil is still fertile, that little plant will grow when it's time. But see if you can, um, just notice all the opportunities you do have in the day to just sit quietly and calm the mind. Or not even trying to calm the mind, just sitting down and interpreting you know, this moment of free time as a gift to yourself. This is time for me to just be with my mind the way that I'd be with a friend and just have a look at what's going on in there and let things just settle down, all on their own, you know, whenever you can, even if you're on the toilet, even if it's five minutes between appointments. Some of you in the interviews were so kind and you said to me, you know, do you need a little break before the next person or should we just sit together for a moment and somebody even gave me a little um, treatment on my tummy, which was very nice. Someone else gave me a cup of tea. So these are all beautiful things we can do for ourselves as well, give ourselves a moment, give our bodies a break and just take those opportunities. Of course, other things we can do is practice loving kindness. Um, in the morning, it's really beautiful. First thing when you wake, just as the sun is rising, at least in the summertime in Norway, it's rising quite early now. So, so too can that loving kindness arise in your heart. And also when we go to bed at night, we can give ourselves loving kindness. We can forgive ourselves for any mistakes. We can try to forgive other people. You know, We can just let go. And I think... Another thing that's helpful with this is remembering death, remembering that we don't know how long we've got. We really don't know, you know, how many days, months, years, or even minutes that we have to be alive. And for me, when I reflect like this, it makes me very careful about saying goodbye to people. What kind of um, way have I said goodbye to the people that I love today? You know, how did I speak to them? before I went to work, or, you know, in an email? Is there an opportunity to just write and say, you know, I'm sorry, I forgive you, or I really care? Yeah? Or to thank somebody for what they mean to you in their life. I have a best friend from childhood. We actually were born in the same hospital, just about eight hours apart. And then from four years old, we were best friends through school and travelled to India, and now she's on my trustee board. <laughs> So she's really more like a sister. And uh, it's such a beautiful relationship. And I guess one that might be possible to take for granted. But knowing the blessing that she is in my life, I frequently, almost every time I write to her, say just how blessed 
we both are. And she says the same to me, you know, we bring it up in our minds all the time. I don't remember us ever having an argument, actually. It's really one of those incredible relationships. And arguments are okay, but it's just a relationship that seems to be the epitome of loving kindness. And, uh, and that is sustained through appreciating what we have. So see if you can do that with your loved ones so that there's no need for regret. And remember that you can do energizing practices for the mind. So again, loving kindness, but also reading the suttas. You know, keep immersing yourself in right view. I heard a talk by Ajahn Brahmali recently, and he said, basically the suttas are a big heap of right view. That's what they are. They're one huge heap of right view. So anywhere you open those suttas, unless there's an interpolated verse that says something against women, which is probably not the Buddha's way. <laughs> Otherwise, I have to say that as a qualifier. But everything else is right view. You know? It's actually very anti-discrimination, very much um, recognising the potential of all human beings for awakening. So much so that the Buddha gave 40 years, 45 years of his life just to free people from suffering, when he could have just sat under his tree and blissed out for the rest of his life. <laughs> so read the suttas from time to time. And yes, the last thing I wanted to say before we practice loving kindness, which is an important end to the retreat, is to remember that patience is the highest spiritual quality on this path. And it's patience with others, it's patience with ourselves, but most of all, it's patience with the process of awakening, the process of meditation. Understanding that we are conditioned, you know, that it's all we can ever do is try and influence those conditions in a positive way, but we cannot um, manipulate the results. So patience is something incredibly beautiful and gentle and wise. And, you know, you have planted those seeds. There's no way that you've had now a taste of the Dhamma, that you'll be able to resist the peace. Even if you don't practice for a few weeks, and you've noticed I'm not pushing this, I would really love to encourage you all to practice every day for as long as you have. You know, maybe 20 minutes, maybe five minutes, maybe an hour, maybe two hours. But please don't set the bar too high. Because even if, if you do set it too high and you f fail to reach your own kind of aim, you might think you're somehow failing. You're not. The fact is those seeds have been planted. The little shoots are going to grow. And there's no way you're going to fall off the path. Even if you seem to fall off it for a while, you'll come back again and again. It's like once you've heard these teachings, you can't forget them. There's something very precious there. And lastly, another very important aspect of the path is to associate with the wise. The Buddha said, wise association is the whole of the spiritual life. And this is what will keep you on track, perhaps more than anything else, because we are influenced, we are conditioned by every, everything we read, everything we hear, every conversation we have. And the conditioning of the Dhamma is incredibly powerful, probably more powerful than ever, anything else. So see if you can get together with a few friends and meditate from time to time. Come to online teachings, listen to Dhamma talks, you know, tell your friends about meditation, uh, maybe there are some groups in Norway that you can be a part of, I'm sure. You can come to our online sessions and, you know, get inspired. Keep that inspiration up because our spiritual friends are people that do inspire us. They do encourage us. They are people that we can look up to and seek to emulate. Yeah. And also we can learn from one another. It's not that somebody has it and you don't. Right. We all have our different qualities. So be a spiritual friend to someone else. And the Buddha said, if we have these spiritual friends on the path, it's inevitable. We have to practice the Eightfold Path. There's no other way. And wherever the Eightfold Path is practiced, there you'll find enlightened beings. Monks, nuns, laymen, laywomen, gender non-binary folks, transgender folks, people from every walk of life, from every race, from every ability or different ability, neurodivergent folks, everybody can be enlightened because we have this precious human birth. So the only thing you have to do is practice the path, start it and continue. <laughs> so we're all very blessed to come in contact with these teachings. And uh, 
hope to see you somewhere on another retreat. So, we only have 20 minutes or so for a guided meta meditation. And this is where we will spread meta, the benefits, the blessings of our life, the goodness of our hearts, with all beings now. So please get comfortable, first of all. As comfortable as my little hippo, if you like. Oh, I guess it's a tiger. Tiger hippo? I'm <laughs> really sure. So just gently closing our eyes and allowing everything to relax. Perhaps nestling into your cosy chair, your comfy seat, making any adjustments that would give you greater comfort and ease, however insignificant it may seem. This shows your body that it's in the friendly presence of your mind and relaxing your shoulders. Softening your brow, your jaw. Trusting the spine, the neck to support your head so you don't need to hold it tight. And just beginning by sharing with yourself a sense of gratitude and appreciation for having given yourself this incredible gift of a beautiful eight day retreat, an opportunity to go deeper in your practice of the Dhamma, the most precious gift you could ever wish for yourself or another being. Trusting that this gift will bear fruit. In own unexpected ways. And with these feelings of gratitude and well-being, allow them to spread through the body. Infusing mindfulness. So that it becomes a medium that allows that kindness to flow. Wherever your awareness goes, so the kindness follows. As if your whole body is soaking up the rays of the sun. And you're relaxing as deeply as you would on a beach, in a deck chair, maybe in a sauna or in a deep turquoise pool. Feeling glad. You've done what is good, what is noble, what is praised by the wise. You're living a beautiful life. Allow yourself to soak in any feelings of gladness, ease, relaxation, joy. Staying connected to those feelings of well-being and ease. 
Just bringing to mind a dear person in your life. And this should really be someone who you have a very simple, pure relationship with. Just bringing them to mind as though they're seated in front of you. And allow this lovely, relaxing, joyful energy to flow to them. Wishing them well in whatever way feels right for you. Without any force, just rejoicing in your generosity. Noticing how it feels to be kind. And imagining this person receiving that kindness. Seeing them smile, light up, relax. Giving just for the sake of giving, without expecting anything in return. And now very gently start allowing this loving kindness to flow outwards into this room towards all your fellow retreatants, those who are present and those who've already left. All of us here practicing together, supporting one another. Imagine this room filling up with a golden glow. With softness, with warmth, with goodwill. As you wish us all to be happy. to be peaceful, to be liberated. May all of us here, companions on this spiritual path, the teachers, those who are practicing with you, which of course includes yourself, All of us here sharing this combined loving kindness as the feelings start to grow. And this kindness, our combined loving kindness, starts to spread even further as though this beautiful glow starts to go through the windows, into the hills, to the little villages nearby, to all the other people in this hotel, the dogs, Clement and Pep, to Lena, the manager, and all the other staff 
You've been looking after us so beautifully. All the little birds in the trees. Maybe beings under the snow. Cats. Imagine this beautiful golden haze spreading through this valley and beyond. Through the whole of Norway where many of you have family and friends. Outwards and unbounded in every direction. To your own home countries, Denmark, Sweden, Croatia, Germany, UK, Canada, America, Sri Lanka, pretty global. Just imagine this loving kindness spreading, leaving no part of the planet Earth untouched. Perhaps spending a little bit longer in those places where you know particular people, perhaps people you'll see later today. May all beings who are known to me or unknown be happy, be peaceful, be truly free. Recognizing that there are beings in this world who are doing well, living good lives, who are happy, who are safe. And there are also beings who live in fear for their very lives. Those who harm other people out of delusion or ill will. Places where people struggle to get their basic needs for food and safety met. Imagine for a moment our loving kindness spreading throughout the world, including those places and bringing a sense of healing and ease. Allowing those who are harming others to lay their weapons down. To remember peace. Where happiness truly lies. All beings. Including invisible beings. and animals too, all beings, human or non-human, far or near. Imagining this planet Earth suffused, glowing, with beautiful, unconditional loving kindness, bringing peace, safety and love to all beings, whoever and wherever they are. If there are beings beyond this planet Earth, the meta spreads to them as well. Wherever there's life, breathing beings, 
our goodwill goes out to them. Allow this metta to become vast, immeasurable, boundless. And allow yourself to just relax. holding all beings in mind with nothing but goodwill, forgiveness. And now gently bringing your mind back, but leaving the glow outside, leaving the world suffused with warmth, but bringing your mind back into this room, sensing all the other retreatants seated here and sensing your own body and mind. Recognizing that you too are one living being among all beings. And offering loving kindness to every little part of yourself. The parts you feel happy about, the parts you may have rejected or excluded from your heart. Imagine those little parts of yourself. Maybe the child who was harmed or the partner who was left, the mother, the parent, who felt they were not good enough. The one who never gets it right, whatever it is. Imagine all those little parts of you. Those little beings in need of love. And open the door of your heart to yourself completely, unconditionally. As though there were a ladder from the ground and they were climbing up into this beautiful, wise, loving heart. An older version of you, with all you know now about forgiveness, about love. And wish yourself well, truly, sincerely, to be free from all suffering and experience, peace and liberation, why not? Sabedewa, 
too peaceful, that's okay. But if you want to smile and come out of the retreat with a smile, I invite you to join in the three ridiculously over-the-top, outrageous sadhus, which means very good, well done, fantastic. So we say sadhu three times, like this. Sadhu. 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 Fantastic, we're spreading this also through the world. <laughs> Not to take things too seriously, but to smile through it all. So. Yeah, thank you all so much for your practice. And thank you, Ajahn, and everyone as well for inviting me as a guest. And I'm sure that you all have something to say. Ha, ha, ha.